Hello everyone. Just wanted to let you know that there is some adult language in today's video. So if that bothers you, or if you've got children around, you might want to watch another video. Thanks. Hey friends, welcome back to History Savvy. Today, I'm going to be checking out a channel that's new to me. This guy is called The Fat Electrician, with his video called The Biggest Logistical Flex of All Time, The Berlin Airlift. Chances are his videos have come across my feed before, but this is the first time I've actually bothered to click on one. The Berlin Airlift is an important topic in 20th century history, American history, British history. It's really at the crossroads of a lot of different parts of 20th century history. So it's a great topic. I'm excited to see what he says about it, and I hope I can add some additional context. So hope you'll join me. Ah yes, that time the communists tried to starve an entire city, so America and the UK teamed up to deliver 4.6 billion pounds of food and supplies to that city using nothing but cargo planes. Nice. I like the intro. Click on the lamp. It's like, all right, kids, sit down. Uncle so-and-so is going to tell you a story. Today we're talking Back about the biggest economic and logistical flex of all time, America's Operation Vittles and the UK's Operation Plainfield, coming together to be known as the Berlin Airlift. But you know, I would say the Marshall Plan is probably the biggest economic flex of at least the 20th century all time. Uh, I don't know enough to say that comfortably, but the Marshall Plan had a much wider impact on world and European history. I mean, the Marshall Plan effectively stopped the communists from gaining popular control in Italy. So that's why I'd say Marshall Plan, Berlin Airlift is cool, but as far as an economic strategy, Marshall Plan takes the cake here. First, a word from our sponsor. This video is brought to you by Henson's Shaving. Okay, here's the deal. Henson. Nice. Before we move on, I have to mention a shirt here, F Communism, which is certainly quite amusing. After World War II, the Allied forces took control of Germany and it was split into pretty much four different chunks. The Soviets got a piece, America got a piece, the French and the British both got a piece. Here's a map of that right here. Okay, here's where it gets a little weird. Berlin was also split into four equal chunks. The problem with that was Berlin was 100 miles into the Soviet territory. So you have this little tiny speck on the map of British, French, and American territory completely surrounded by the USSR. While that is weird, it was... I wouldn't say it's weird. Uh, Berlin was an important city for the ideology of the Nazis. Um, it's it's the, the head city. So if you're wanting to conquer a people and let them know that you are well and truly conquered, you're going to want to take their capital city. The same division of the city uh, happened in Vienna as well. So it wasn't just Germany and Berlin. It was also in Austria and Vienna. This, ha this happened as well wasn't really a problem because right after World War II, everybody was still an ally. So America, the British and the French had no problems using the roadways and the trains to get food and supplies to their section of Berlin. Now, just so we're on this. Now, they had no problems because discussion about how to move supplies in and out of Berlin was never actually discussed at the end of the war. No one bothered to discuss it. They did, however, discuss uh, the rights of the air. So each victorious ally was guaranteed uh, an air corridor into Berlin that was 20 miles wide. And so they didn't discuss traffic, land traffic to and from, but they did discuss air traffic. Same page, Berlin and essentially all of Germany to a slightly lesser extent is essentially a third world country at this point in time. Berlin in particular has essentially been turned into rubble from allied bombings. The entire German economy is in the toilet and all of the German people are not getting a lot of sympathy from the global community because, well, they kind of started it. Now with the allied forces in control. Right. Um, now sympathy, there was sympathy for a lot of basic German people that uh, was had in Christian and humanitarian societies inside the United States. The same thing happened with Japan, even though there were enemies during the war, there was this Christian uh, humanitarian attitude that says we won. Now it's time to rebuild a better peaceful world. And we're going to do that starting with giving them food and we're going to give them clothes and other material goods. Now this idea was also shared by, uh, the leaders of the United States and Britain, France and others, as they didn't want Germany to be uh, a fertile field for a future fascist dicta dictator that would send the world into another world war. I mean, Germany 
was was highly industrialized and in two world wars they'd use that industrial capability to cause the whole world a lot of problems was the, was the general idea so there was sympathy for the german people but it wasn't like oh we're going to be best friends now there was there was a sympathy said look you duffed it we need to move forward and i understand that we need to help you control of germany it is their job and their responsibility to help take care of the german people now the western powers america great britain and france they're all on the same page they all have the same game plan they want to go in render aid in the short term to the german people then in the long term help prop up their economy get them back on their own feet and then they can leave the ussr on the other hand aka the communists absolutely hate that idea the last thing a bunch of communists want is people being able to take care of themselves so they step in and they're like no absolutely not we're going to build a communist utopia out of this place. So in order to stop the Western powers from helping Germany, they decide that they're going to print billions and billions of Reichsmarks, the German currency. They devalue the currency. So there's so much money that it's no longer a store of value to the point. An important part of this is it was the responsibility of the Soviet Union at this time to print the Reichsmarks for the German people. So they had total control over the value of the German money. And this was a problem for the allies. Let's see if he talks about that. That it literally takes a wheelbarrow full of money to buy a loaf of bread. Because of this, the already struggling German economy completely collapses and a black market sets in. And the new currency for Germany is essentially cigarettes and food. And this goes on for like two years with the West trying to okay. negotiate with the USSR on how to proceed. And during that time, the people of Berlin are quite literally starving and freezing to death with the average Berliner eating less than a thousand calories a day. Eventually, the West steps in and they're like fuck it we're just gonna do it without the communists because we have to help these people so they create a new yeah uh so the average berliner uh, i think the average german more broadly speaking was uh eating fewer calories in the few years after the end of the world war ii than the uh, average unemployed american was eating during the great depression so it was it was pretty nominal and there were people dying at pretty significant rates in fact the population of the city of berlin was actually shrinking between 1945 and 1948 New type of currency for Germany known as the Deutschmark, and it's going to be seen as a real store of value and help rebuild the German economy. The Soviets find out about this and they freak out, basically break all diplomatic communication with the Western powers, and they officially want to break up and just have East versus West, capitalism versus communism, Hungary versus Fed. This is where the Cold War really starts kicking off. And the first ideological battleground of the Cold War is going to be Berlin, because remember, it's 100 miles into Soviet territory, and a big chunk of it is still controlled by the Western powers so the soviets decide they need to take over that part of berlin too they can't have a little speck of capitalism in their communist utopia now luckily for the communists it's an easy fix they really don't have to do anything because the minute the west berliners see what a communist utopia really looks like they're going to willfully and freely denounce capitalism and run over and become communist too right wrong that's never going to happen because communism sucks it's always sucked and it's always going to suck so the communists are going to do what they always do they are going to basically present west berlin the option join or we will attempt to kill you because if you don't know that's the dirty little secret to communism they always talk about seizing the means of production what they never bother to tell you is that people are also part of that means of production and they will seize you too so that's exactly what they do i mean that's certainly one way to look at it. Uh, the idea is that it's not a certain group of people that seizes the means of production. It's the people themselves. So if you are a factory worker, uh, you get to now own a part of, of what you produce. So, but reality does show that it ends up being a very small group of people who gets to control what everybody else is doing. Do. They attempt to seize West Berlin. They blockade it off from the Western powers. They cut off every road, every railway, and every waterway so that the Western powers cannot get West Berlin food or any other supplies. And then they cut off the power to that section of the city, quite literally freezing and starving them to death until they comply. So obviously this is a diplomatic and humanitarian... Uh, I'm not sure if you mentioned the date, but the, the Soviets cease... Um, they... It, they begin the blockade, basically, at the end of June, I think June 24th, 1948. But this was not the first time that this kind of thing had happened. If you go back into April or March 1948, there was kind of a, a, a soft trial run of this kind of blockade where the Soviets were saying, nope, 
All traffic must cease and cannot be allowed in or out unless, or at least across Soviet territory, unless a Soviet inspections officer has gone through everything. And it caused a huge kerfuffle. It was eventually ironed out, um, but it, the blockade was not the first time that this had happened. So the United States and the United Kingdom had had some idea that this was a possibility, and uh, at least the United Kingdom actually thought about what are we going to do if this becomes a, a bigger problem. Humanitarian disaster. All the military leadership runs over to President Truman, and they're like, "Hey, what do you want us to do?" Basically, we got three options. Option A: we can start rolling tanks in and kick off World War III right now. Option B: we can just leave the Berlin people there to die. And option C: we can try to fly in as much food and supplies as possible. But getting enough to feed an entire city is basically going to be impossible. What do you want to do? Now, obviously, I'm now starting an immediate war was not a real option. The option, at least in the mind of the commander of the U.S. Army Air Forces in Europe, was saying, you know what, let's fly some empty B-29 bombers in the direction of, of Soviet strong points to freak them out and see what they do. Um, there was also, uh, like you mentioned, the idea that do we just, do we just give up the city? Um, the French, I think this was the French ambassador speaking with an American ambassador said, you know, is, is the juice really worth the squeeze here? Is it really worth keeping uh, a presence in Berlin? Uh, said, you know, we'll, we'll, the French, we, the French will follow what you do as Americans. But from our point of view, this isn't super necessary to our overall economic goals for Germany. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. Truman basically said, we're America. We don't start world wars. We just finish them. Also, and I quote, we stay in Berlin, period, which narrows it down to one single option. They are going to fly in enough food and enough supplies to try to feed all of West Berlin. Here's the catch with that. The American leadership has absolutely no idea what that's going to take or how to even proceed. So they go to the British government who has just spent the last decade rationing their own people and they have a great understanding of what it takes to keep a large population of people fed and warm. So Great Britain crunches. Um, well, let me... I guess I'll let him finish the numbers and they figure to get every single person in West Berlin 1700 calories a day it's going to be 1500 tons of food every single day in addition to that so Britain was still under a, a rationed system and now he talked about how Britain crunched the numbers to figure all this out they did this before the Berlin blockade even happened that's when I said that they had kind of uh had some ideas about what are we going to do if this happens again that's when the brits figured out how much food um will they need to ship in to keep things running now this was mainly focused on their own uh, personnel inside west berlin but they just scaled up the numbers to include average berliners as well now i don't know if he'll talk about it but when the blockade kicked off and power was shut down people just society broke down quite quick in the sense that nobody was turning up for work because they didn't have power. Uh, they were facing starvation. They didn't know what they were going to do. And so people were just standing around in street corners outside, just scrambling for any scrap of news that they could possibly get about what the plan was to save them, to keep them fed. Were they going to be surrendered to the Soviets? What what were the Allies going to do? Were they going to get engaged in another war? Just what was going to go on? And so the rumor rail really, really cranked out at this time. And a lot of, of Berliners were really freaked out. Since the power got cut off, they're going to need 2,500 tons of coal and fuel every single day. Okay, 4,000 tons, just so we're all on the same page. That is... Sorry, as I'm listening to him, I'm thinking about a lot of things too. So when the Berlin blockade happened, the Soviets initiated their own blockade, uh, the Allies did the same. So they did not allow uh, goods to go from west into east. Not just Berlin, we're talking about um, the all of the parts in between. So from, from Bavaria on up until the North Sea. And that actually hurt Germans living in East Germany as well. And it, it, it certainly pressured the Soviets. Eight million pounds of supplies 
every single day just to keep everyone alive. And the best cargo plane they have to work with at this point in time is the C-47 Skytrain, which has a maximum capacity of three tons, meaning that they are gonna have to land 1,333 cargo planes into Berlin every single day. To put that into perspective, there's only 1,440 minutes in a day, meaning that one plane has to land every minute and eight seconds. This is impossible. Despite that, the newly formed United States Air Force says hold my nuclear bombs and watch this shit because on June 26, 1948, two days after the Soviet blockade, they launch Operation Vittles where they are going to try to feed an entire city via cargo plane. Two days after that, June 28th, the UK says, hey, we're gonna help too, and the RAF launches Operation Plane Fair, and together this becomes known as the Berlin Airlift, and right out of the gate, it is a complete and utter shit show. They're trying to fly. So not only do they have C-47s at this point, these C-47s were also well used and battered uh, throughout the course of World War II. So you had planes that had participated in D-Day over Normandy. You had planes that had participated um, in, in operations in North Africa. So these planes were not in the best of shape at this time. Say nothing of the planes, your airfields were also in very rough shape. Um, they actually had to build additional airfields for uh, the capacity to be brought in for the air traffic that was necessary to make this uh, airlift, this air bridge successful. Fly in planes from absolutely everywhere. It is disorganized chaos. There's planes crashing. There's mid-air collisions. It's a complete disaster. And on their best day, they're maybe able to get a thousand tons of supplies, less than a fifth of what they need. Now, at this point, the condition... I don't know that I would say it's a disaster. It certainly has its struggles. Because if it was a disaster, then that would have forced a lot of people to say, is this really worth doing? Like, we're not achieving our goals here, and it doesn't look like we're going to. So I, I don't think it was a disaster in Berlin are getting worse and worse by the day. The communists are essentially laughing at the stupid capitalist pigs, at which point America calls up one of its main characters, a man by the name of General William Tunner. All right, this is a guy that coordinated all the logistics of getting supplies into China during World War II when they had to fly over the Himalayas. If anybody can unfuck this situation, <laughs> it's going to be him. And that's exactly what he does. So General Tunner comes in and he's like, here's the deal. We're going to fly these planes like we're conducting an orchestra. There's three air channels to Berlin. The two on the outside are going to be planes going to Berlin. And the one in the middle is going to be planes leaving Berlin. For the two air channels going into Berlin, we're going to launch one plane every three Three minutes all day every single day and those planes are going to fly at five separate altitudes staggering every single time to give them just enough time to land the germans on the receiving end of this are like we're literally starving to death we got to help out the americans and the british with this so they show up and they start unloading the cargo planes for them and they get so good at unloading these planes that they can unload all three tons of cargo in under seven minutes and help get the planes turned around and sent back out and this turns into one. So the Germans just didn't just show up. It was an organized affair. Uh, they let the populace know that there was these job openings as unloaders from these planes. And a huge number of men showed up to try and get these jobs. As you were not only in paid in, in money, but you got food and a hot meal as well. So there was a huge incentive for German men to get a job working unloading these planes. One of the most beautiful humanitarian team effort moments in human history. There's American and British pilots, air crew members, mechanics, all just showing up in West Germany without even being called to help with this effort and to fly and repair these planes to keep them going around the clock. And then it, it, this wasn't this wasn't just uh, like we need to pull together altruism kind of thing. There was economic and and actual incentives like i'm going to survive if i participate this wasn't altruism there was economic moral uh, incentives that brought people together here over in berlin the same thing is happening there's luftwaffe airplane mechanics showing up to help oh, I, uh I, sorry luftwaffe i i'm laughing at his pronunciation of of luftwaffe I know he doesn't speak German. It's not his fault, but it was a pretty stinking funny translation. 
prepare the American and British cargo planes to keep everything running. The two sides that were fighting against each other just a few years ago are now working together to save people. Everybody involved in this operation gets so good at what they're doing that the choke point that's holding up even more progress is that they don't have enough airfields to land the planes on. So the Germans straight up build another one. The only problem with that was there was this big ass apartment building in the way. And when the pilots lowered their landing gear, their landing gear would only clear that that apartment roof by like 20 feet which seems like it would be kind of terrifying so the germans are like hey do you want us to rip that apartment building down what do you guys want us to do and the american and raf pilots are like bro we just got done flying in world war ii with you guys and the japanese shooting at us the apartment's gonna be fine trust me and sure enough <laughs> I, I that's that's nice but given the fact that the berlin was still in in trümmer as you would say in german in rubble usable living blocks were at a premium. So I don't think the Germans are like, yeah, we'll knock that down. They might have done, but I'm a little skeptical at that point. Fair enough, they start not only hitting, but exceeding the quota of 4,500 tons a day. And this infuriates the Soviets. This is the biggest economic and logistical flex of all time. It shouldn't even be possible. And yet America, the UK, and the people of West Berlin are somehow pulling it off. At this point, the Soviets decide they have to try to do something to stop this. So they start sending up all their fighter planes to try to mess with all the American and British cargo pilots by flying too close. They're basically trying to mess up air traffic, cause accidents, do anything they can to slow down this logistical miracle. However, it doesn't really work. Why? Because the American and British pilots know that it's basically a bluff because it's essentially a giant game of fuck around and find out because if the Soviets actually do anything, it's going to kick off World War III and at this point in time, America is the only country on the planet that has nuclear bombs and a president that's not afraid to use them. Okay, if you're not picking up... Yeah, that's true. Um, Truman did drop the bombs, order the bombs dropped on Japan, and it wasn't until 1949 that the Soviets actually had their first successful nuclear test happen. But imagine for a moment, uh, if you're a Soviet fighter pilot being sent up to harass... Uh, the planes of the Berlin airlift. If you're just a one guy who's just flying around these other planes, how stupid do you look? You've got planes flying at different altitudes. You've got dozens of planes. You can just see planes going and coming all the time. And you're just one plane. You're going to look really insignificant. You're going to look really stupid. So I wonder if the Soviets actually, how many did they send up? That's a question I have, because otherwise you look incredibly stupid. You're not threatening. You're just one plane, maybe two planes in the face of dozens of planes. What I'm putting down, I'm trying to tell you that the American and RAF pilots are flying with the confidence of knowing that if one of these Soviets shoots them down, President Truman is going to bitch slap their entire country with the sun. Needless to say, they were unfazed by the Soviet harassment. How unfazed... Uh, given Truman's reluctance to uh, follow McCarthy's advice and drop a nuclear bomb on, on China just a few years later, I don't think he would have just slapped that big red button and uh, bombed the Soviet Union over one, one plane. It's, it's a nice idea, but it's, it's a little overblown were they thank you so much for asking cue our next main character gail halverson aka the candy bomber he was one of the mini pilots that was flying supplies into berlin and somewhere along the way he decided that he was going to start dropping candy bars with little handkerchief parachutes out of the window of his plane over west berlin so that the kids could get some candy and eventually this caught on and all the kids were waiting where the planes would fly over hoping that they would get a candy bar then the american government caught on and they're like oh shit this is a great propaganda opportunity. Imagine what it would be like if every single plane was dropping candy out of it. So that's exactly. So Halverson, how this started, according to what Halverson said, is he was taking photographs of planes landing uh, at, I think it was Tempelhof Airfield. And he noticed a bunch of children who had congregated at the, the edge of the airfield. And so he went over to them and he provided them a few pieces of gum because they were so, so desperate. And the kids took the gum, they broke it up into pieces, shared it. And the kids who didn't get an actual piece of gum sniffed the gum wrappers. And so that really tugged at his heartstrings. And so he and a crewmate decided to pool their candy rations and drop it to these kids. Like he said, he would, he 
he was going to. And they tied little parachutes to them because they didn't want the candy to, you know, put a lump on a kid's head. And that's how this, this candy bomber thing actually got started. It picked up, other guys joined in, and it just kind of grew from there. Now, the, the handkerchiefs, he told the kids, look, I'm, I'm going to need to reuse these handkerchiefs, so please give them back to me or somebody else so we can reuse them to give you more candy. And, and it grew up from there. So Gail Halverson, being a original av geek, um, helped start this magnificent thing called Operation Little Vittles and become the Berlin Candy Bomber. Exactly what they do. They start dropping a bunch of candy out of every plane and then they make propaganda out of it. But then it gets bigger because all the American candy companies start sponsoring it and donating even more candy to drop. And then it gets bigger because all the kids in America and the UK start raising money at school to buy candy to give to the kids of Germany. And they're giving out even more candy. And the Soviets have to stand there and watch as the Americans and the British are not only flying in a literal Costco worth of shit into West. <laughs> Berlin every single day, but they're dropping candy out of their planes like it's a fucking parade the entire time. And this is all going on while East Germany and East Berlin is eating potatoes and standing in bread lines, and it makes the Soviets look like the biggest assholes on the planet. Because not only are the people of East Germany watching the Western world essentially move heaven and earth to help out West Berlin, they're also watching the Soviets be more interested in disrupting America and the UK from helping people than they are in helping helping the people of East Germany. In short, America and the UK are playing to win and the Soviets are playing to not lose and it is leading to a lower quality of life for all of East Germany. As it turns out, Sun Tzu was yet again correct when he said the sun may rise in the east, but it sets in the west, and that's because west side is the best side. But that's not what it means. Okay. <laughs> really? Not even close. <laughs> that might have been Ice Cube, actually. Anyways, so now in retaliation for all this, America and nice the UK and pretty much the entire Western world are going to put a bunch of embargoes on the Soviet Union and punish them financially and economically. Now, the Soviets absolutely cannot afford this, but they keep telling themselves, it's okay, winter is coming, and as soon as winter gets here, they're not going to be able to land all these planes, and this whole thing is going to fall apart. We just have to wait out long enough for winter to slow down America and the UK. So that's what they do. They just try to shoulder the financial burden and wait for winter to come and put a stop to this entire thing. Winter. Now, <clears throat> on a diplomatic level, there are negotiations happening, conferences being had between the Soviets and the Western allies. Uh, there was a conference in, in Moscow where there was some hope that Stalin would, uh, would ease back on some of his his restrictions uh, that of course didn't end up happening but the point is is there was still lines of communication open between the soviets and the western allies at this time here comes and winter it does slow down some of the flights but here's the catch America was also developing bigger, better cargo planes, and now America isn't just flying the C-47, America's flying their new cargo plane, the C-74 Globemaster, and as opposed to the previous C-47 carrying only three tons, the Globemaster can carry 25. So despite the fact that weather can sometimes delay flights, America and the UK continue to improve and increase the amount of supplies that they are delivering daily. And by Easter Sunday... Now... The Globemaster is a terrific plane, and it did fly into Berlin during the Berlin airlift. But don't be mistaken, it did not play a significant role in this operation. The reasons for that are the runways, the airport runways, were not constructed to handle the weight of this aircraft. And the Soviets said, hey, we don't really like that aircraft uh, because these, these doors here you could stuff them with bombs and you could bomb us. Now that seems like a really weak argument because of its effectiveness in bringing in supplies. But in any event, the C-50, sorry, the C-74 was, the Globemaster was not heavily used during the course of the airlift. The stars of the show are the C-47 Skytrain and the C-54 Skymaster. The, as we know, the C-47s were the initial aircraft used, and then in July, only a few weeks after the start of the blockade, the C-54s started to show up, and this is what Galver Halverson was in 
um, when he became the candy bomber. So C-47, C-54s, they're the real stars of the show. This plane's cool. The Globemaster is cool. It's an important part of American military aviation history, but it's not the star of the show here. In 1949, they would break their own record, landing 1,383 planes in a single day, delivering 13,000 tons of supplies, which is 26 million pounds, which obviously is like 11.8 million kilograms or roughly 87 blue whales. Yeah, the United States Air Force and the RAF shipped 87 blue whales worth of crap into West Berlin in a single day. And because of this, it becomes very apparent to the Soviet Union that America can and will keep this shit up forever if they have to. And they are finally forced to give up the blockade because they cannot shoulder the financial burden anymore. And that would come down on May 12th, 1949. And with the roads and railways to West Berlin finally open once again, the Berlin airlift would come Come to an end after 15 months 277,000 flights spanning 92,000 miles and delivering 2.3 million tons of aid which is roughly 4.6 billion pounds or 15,333.3333333 blue whales this is the greatest why is it blue whales why are blue whales always like the uh the size against which you measure anything really large. Don't know. In any event, the Soviets, they lifted the blockade. However, the Allies continued the airlift for another five or six months, just in case the Soviets decided to reinstate the blockade. Logistical and humanitarian feat ever accomplished, and the Western world did it with communism doing everything it could to slow it down. So in conclusion, Fuck communism. <laughs> the best way to support the channel is go buy some merch at thefatelectrician.com. Quack bang. Out. Does have some sweet looking merch. But yeah, good video. Uh, definitely gives you the basics of the Berlin airlift. Um, and I hope I was able to fill in a little, uh, little bit more of those gaps. There's a, a number of good books out there. Um, a lot on Gail Halverson as the candy bomber. Um, I would also read parts from Truman by David McCullough. Um, he talks about sort of what was going on inside Truman's White House at this time. Good book. I can't think of any others that come to mind, but if I do think of them, I'll put them down in the description. So with that said, I'd like to thank you for watching this video, and I hope to see you in the next one.